Okay, today's colloquium is uh, Eamon O'Brien, Algorithms, Matrix Groups, Success, Failure, and Challenge. Thank you, Martin. Let me begin by thanking you for the invitation to both be here and to give a lecture this afternoon. Um, after two, two years and three months of being in a comfortable prison, it's quite nice to be somewhere else. Uh, the other thing is I set myself the impossible task and decided to talk about a project which has run for 30 years and which has involved many, many people producing lots of nice mathematics along the way. And I decided to try to summarize key points of it in 55 minutes or thereabouts. So um, pardon me if I fail, because I think it was an unrealistic goal to have set myself, but we'll see how we go. In any case, the context of all of this is where I, I'm a computational group theorist. I'm talking about algorithms for working with matrix groups. And I'm really talking about the so-called matrix recognition project, which has been running since the early 90s and involves so many mathematicians to try and list all of them. It's a hard job. It would actually be easier to list the compliments, <laughs> and I may well choose to do that at various points along the way. <laughs> so the complex is I've given a bunch of matrices, and I'm interested in knowing something about the group that they generate. Uh, I, for all intents and purposes, I'm thinking of X as being a generated set, which is a small cardinality, fixed cardinality. I'm not worried about it somehow depending on the input. I'm thinking of it as being two or three or five generators rather than something which depends on D. And here's a bunch of questions which group theorists are interested in answering about the group. First of all, the group is finite, so I'm interested in knowing what the order of the group is. It's a very natural question. Secondly, things like the zero P subgroups would be in any device of the order of G. Um, I'm talking about wanting to know things like consciously classes of elements of subgroups, things like normalizers of subgroups. You can add to that your favorite list of group theoretic questions, and that's what we're interested in trying to be able to frame an answer for. First of all, it's worth pointing out that the goal of matrix recognition was to develop efficient algorithms, and the word efficient has multiple meanings. To people like Richard Parker, it means, can I do impossible computations in a finite period of time? So he wants to work with 10,000 by 10,000 matrices to find over GF17 and decide questions like the irreducibility of the underlying module. I'm not as ambitious as that. I'm thinking of perhaps D being up to 100. I'm thinking of Q being reasonably small, but I don't want to make a big fuss about what the cardinality of Q is. And when we're talking about it from a practical point of view, I'm also talking about can I actually implement the algorithms? Can I actually get them to run to answer some question which a human being could not actually answer? That would be a nice goal to have. Of course, we're also interested in the question of theoretical complexity. And from that point of view, it's worth making the following statement that one measure of, of the cost of algorithms is that we're talking about time polynomial and the size of the input. But the input here essentially involves d squared entries with length log q for the, for the entries in the matrix. So we're thinking of the input size as being d squared log q, a big O of that. Uh, in practice, I do care about the log Q there. I don't really want algorithms which involve the size of the field, because when we have the size of the field and I start working with uh, GF 5 to 10, that becomes a different task, just to put some context in this. Okay, well, the first thing you might think of is to try to borrow ideas from computation groups, where there's been very successful approach over a long period of time to use the notion of a base and strong generating set for the group. This dates back to work with Charlie Sims from the 1970s who defined the notion of a base. It gives you a stabilizer chain. You, most algorithms for working with computation groups exploit that stabilizer chain. You're using Schreier's lemma to get you generators for elements of the stabilizer, and you work down the chain, lifting information down through the chain in order to answer questions about the group. You get a data structure out of that in practice, which allows you to decide the order of the group, which tells you about membership in the group, and will allow you to answer questions such as, what is a word in the defining generators of the group, which evaluates to my given element, if it does lie in the group? That's a so-called constructive membership problem. But you can take all of that and translate it to the matrix context that very naturally, you can think of action on vectors, 
more sensibly, you can think about action in subspaces. Uh, but there are fundamental problems which arise when you try to translate this. Um, the central problem is that a good subgroup chain may not exist. By good, I mean that the index of one stabilizer in the chain in the, in its predecessor must be at least reasonable. Or well, reasonable depends on who you are again. Let's say for practical purposes, I don't really want to work with a chain where the indices are greater than about 10 million. That's a good, that's an upper limit on what I would like to work with. Of course, there are experts who come up with good techniques for working with larger ones, but we're talking about machinery which will be commonly available, which can be used by people for the purpose of investigating the structure. And the basic strong generated set algorithm for computation groups is proven to be in polynomial time. It runs in time O n to the fourth or O n to the fifth, depending on how much space you're willing to allocate, wherein is the input degree of the computation. And but key realization which is hardly a revelation to this audience, is that we've got a nice natural subgroup sitting inside of SN of index N, and we stabilize it with point. If I try to go to the corresponding situation for the GL, and I come down to, for example, Q to the D dot GL D minus one Q, what's the index? The index is of the order of Q to the D. I'm not worried about the finessing of it, but suffice to say that if I'm talking about polynomial time and I use this approach, I've already lost the band. I'm getting something which is, involves Q to the D. So um, it says to us that we've got to come up with better approaches than simply modeling what was done in the publication of work. And the algorithms which have been developed as part of the matrix group recognition project over the past number of years, all of them essentially exploit random elements of some kind, they employ randomization. I'm not going to talk about methods for selecting random elements. Some of them are well known. There's Babai's beautiful algorithm doubling the cube. There's a product replacement algorithm. Both of those algorithms are proven to run in polynomial time to produce uh, random elements. The latter, the product replacement, is a very easy procedure to actually implement and to run, which is different on Loxy's uh, doubling the cube algorithm. But essentially, we can assume for all intents and purposes that we have access to a ready supply of random elements. And there are two classes of algorithms, which again, this audience is going to be very familiar with, Monte Carlo algorithms, where there's a possibility of error associated with computation. You can uh, bound that error by specifying it to input. And there's Las Vegas, which is the better version, which does not error, and you can allow it to fail with a small probability again, which it uses and prescribes. All of this relies very heavily on Statistical group theory, which there's a number of experts in the audience, I'll talk about some of that later. Basically, you're often talking about wanting for the purpose of analysis of the algorithm, you're wanting to have very precise information, proportions, very precise, detailed information about the proportion of elements of a certain kind. For example, the shape of the characteristic polynomial. Does it have a linear factor? Does it have a certain number of factors of a particular degree, etc.? But most of the algorithms that I'm going to be talking about are not just working for the natural representation. We also want to think about algorithms which are representation dependent. And there is a notion of black box, which I'm not going to formally define. Suffice to say, we have algorithms which do not exploit features of the input representation, but instead just exploit the axioms which hold for a group. So you can multiply elements together. You can decide whether a given computer an inverse. You can decide equality with the identity. That's what differentiates black box from, for example, finite presented groups. But essentially, you can think of black box as an abstraction. And often, algorithms have been developed which started life as black box or started life as for natural representation and have ended up being transformed the one or other way. And the two have often fed into one another. Again, the one important point down here is the result of Landazulian sites, which tells us that if we're talking about cross characteristic representations, then the input degree already involves Q. And so, in many respects, if you're talking about non natural representations or non defining characteristic representations, more correctly, then you've got this input to the algorithm, you've already got a Q. And so, my my structure that I don't that I don't want Q turning up in the complexity is not such a problem any longer in that world. It becomes essentially a problem for defining characteristic representations of matrix groups. Again, that's an important point which will turn up at various stages along the way. 
Okay, so what's actually happened over the last number of years has been the exploitation of Asperger's classification of maximal subgroups of classical groups and a rather sloppy generalization of that to talk about all subgroups of linear groups. And effectively what it says as the following is one of, one of the possible approaches is that if we're given a group G, which is contained inside of GLDQ, with some generating set, then one strategy is to determine at least one of the Asperger trend categories, which arise from these classification maximal subgroups. There's C1 to C8, and then there's C9, which is the almost simple uh, catch-all bin at the end, which contains an awful lot of interesting groups, but it's regarded as the refuse bin in some sense for things which we haven't been able to put into one of the other bins. Okay, so suppose we can compute it, well then, if there is a normal subgroup associated with that ash battery category, and I'll illustrate that in a moment, then what we want to be able to do is we want to be able to work with N, and we want to be able to work with the factor group recursively. I'm using the word recognize here very loosely. I'll, I'll try and justify that term a little bit later. But suffice to say, I want to refine this process to obtain composition series for G. So that's the sort of strategy which Sheryl and Peter Neumann suggested back in the 1990s, and which has been followed by a lot of people since then. Okay, so prototype. The prototype of the Ashbacher decomposition, a very nice case, is, for example, the case where G acts imprimitively on the underlying vector space. So what have I got? I've got a homomorphism from G to the symmetric group of degree R, where R divides D, and I've got a kernel associated with this homomorphism, which gives me my normal subgroup associated with the class C2, or people who know such things. Okay, and we think of this in this way, and I'll come back to this, because we end up talking about something called a composition tree as a data structure which emerges from this process. And we think of it as a composition tree in the following sense that we have a root node here, we have a kernel, and we have an image. If I can now process the image, I can hopefully get a lot of information about the kernel and proceed with my refinement in order to produce a composition series for G. Okay, an algorithm to actually decide membership in C2, the imprimitive case was developed long ago, it's 1996 by Derek and Charles Lee and Green, and myself and Sarah Reese. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But what is worth, an enormous amount of what I'm talking about is joint work with Charles over 30 odd years. So if I don't mention him, I've done it now at least once to credit an enormous amount of this stuff to his ingenuity and drive to actually get to certain points. Okay, so I want to talk about two of the Ashford categories, one sort of a success story and the other far from a success story. So the success story is of course reduced to groups. Uh, the algorithm which has become known universally is the MeetX. What does it do? It decides whether GX irreducibly on the underlying vector space if, if, it, if it doesn't, you produce, you find an explicit submodule. And now you can take the action of the submodule, take the action of the factor module, and recursively go on from there. And of course, the origins of that date back to Richard Parker, they long precede any notions of matrix recognition. Uh, there is a paper of Richard from 1984 which spells it out. There was a generalization by Holt and Reese, and some of the cases left over for analysis were completed by Evanius and Knox. I just want to mention the sort of elements that you're interested in because it will illustrate the point of statistical group theory within this. This is, this is essentially the algorithm of Holt and Reese that I'm talking about. We take the irreducible module, we think of the action algebra, but we're interested in finding elements theta, which have a factor in the characteristic polynomial, such that this condition is satisfied, such that the degree of the factor is the dimension of the null space, and we evaluate the characteristic polynomial in theta. If we can find such an element, then we get a guaranteed outcome from the Metax. So the Metax variously is described as Las Vegas or Monte Carlo. We can never quite reach up, a rich conclusion on that matter. Uh, despite the authors of it being present in the room, I'm not sure that it's a beneficial discussion to have at the moment. But if we do find such an element, then we get a definitive answer. I just wanted to give you an example of the sort of result which you can get, which says to you, this is work of a master student of mine, which completed this year, which says to you that the proportion of such elements is at least this quantity. And if your mental arithmetic is not up to it, that's 0.12. Right? 
which is 50% larger than the last estimate, which was provided by Holt and Reese and Evangelist and Lux. So it's gone up from 0.08 up to 0.12. That's a marvelous achievement. It says to you, roughly choose eight random elements and you've reached a conclusion. Okay. It sort of points towards an example of analysis, in this case of matrix algebra, you're talking about the structure of the characteristic polynomial and you're trying to get a lower bound in particular. And you can see the lower bound is completely independent of all parameters, it's a constant. Okay, that's the success story. The non-success story is tensor products. And this is in some sense the failure of, of the whole project if I want to talk about it. I, I mean, I, I'm going to put up quite a lot about it, but I'm not going to suggest that you devote very much attention to the detail of it. What I really want to draw out is that if you want to settle tensor products from a, a formal point of view, a formal theoretical point of view, you may have to consider covering groups because you've got a nasty feature that you have a lambda and you have a lambda inverse and these kill each other off, so to speak, in the tensor product. And so effectively, you could be looking over covering groups. That's a particularly bad strategy to try and follow. And so what you want is you want an internal description, which is relevant to the group and to the module itself, rather than something which depends on something external. And 25 years ago, Charles and I looked at this problem. What we found was that we could, con that we could construct a family of g invariant projective geometries in the underlying space, whose flats in the projective geometry are certain subspaces of B. And in fact, the flats are spaces of this form, where you're thinking of a tensor product U tensor B, what you're ending up producing are, are spaces of time U tensor X, where X runs over subspaces of W. Okay, a lot of information there. All I really want to do is to flash up the next theorem, which says to you that you've got an equivalence between the existence of the projective geometry and class tensor decomposition, classes of equivalence, classes of tensor decompositions. It's a one-to-one -one correspondence. We wanted to exploit this characterization of tensor products to actually answer the question. It's internal now in the sense that all we care about is the underlying space, all we care about is the group acting. I'm not, I haven't even formally defined all these terms. I really just want you to understand that we're interested in equivalence, we're interested in producing this projective geometry. If we produce this projective geometry, we get a change of basis coming from the images of points in the projective geometry, and hence we can exhibit the tensor decomposition. Okay, so how do we construct the projective geometry? Well, if the action on one of the factors is not faithful, I, I left it in quotes to say it's easy to construct a point in the geometry. Uh, easy means we look at certain elements, we look at characteristic polynomials, we look at certain tensor factors in them, and we can produce something called a projectivity, which gives us a point in the projective geometry. It's all nice linear algebra to a great extent with a very little group action. On the other hand, if it's the case that you have got a faithful action, then what we're reduced to doing is to try to find subgroups which are guaranteed to act reducible on at least one of the factors. If we can find a subgroup which acts reducibly, then we can indeed produce a flat of the form U tensor X and from that extract a point. Okay, so all I've done so far is to reduce from one horror down to another horror, which is how to produce a subgroup which is guaranteed to act reducibly. And here's the nub of the problem. We want to construct an H which has the property that it actually has few submodules in its action on V. And if we can do that, then we can process the submodules from that by means, again, to a great extent of linear algebra, we can produce a point in the geometry. Okay, one natural class that we do is to take P local subgroups where P is the defining characteristic. But difficulty from a, if you want an algorithm out of this, fine, you get an algorithm with any difficulty. If you want a polynomial time bound, you do not get a polynomial time bound this calculation. The reality is we're very subject to what the index of the, uh, the smallest P local subgroup inside of G is, being able to construct that subgroup, etc. I mean, in wonderful cases like A9, there's a, a 168 dimensional representation of A9, 
You can write down AA in dimension 168. It acts reducibly. So hence you can find the tensor decomposition very effectively. But if you want something which runs generally, we're reduced to this sort of approach. And then we're dependent very heavily on how many submodules do you find. If you find a manageable number of submodules, you can process it, you can finish the computation. So from an algorithmic point of view, it's complete. From a theoretical point of view of analysis to say that it runs upon a number of time, not a chance. And despite years of trying to persuade Martin Liebeck to be interested in this problem and to prove that we could find such a subgroup, I've failed. That's one of my failures, Martin. I'm just identifying the failures. <laughs> that was a failure to persuade you to take on this problem. <laughs> okay, let me also mention a different kind of result, which has an equal failure associated with it, which is from Alex Reva in 2022. I should point out that for people who were in Ohio, in 2003 at a conference, I believe that Alex Reba presented a version of this result. I'm the editor who's been handling the paper. It's taken two years to get to the stage where we have this statement. And literally, I accepted the paper about one week ago. So there you are. What does this say? This says, suppose we've got an irreducible module over an algebraically closed field. And the associative algebra, hum BB, has a G invariant proper subalgebra, if and only if it's either intensity composable or has non-trivial system of improbability. Okay, so the, the algebraically closed field, we can fudge that we just have to go up to an appropriate extension. The difficulty with this, it does underpin an algorithm, but the difficulty is the dimension of the matrices which you end up working with. You start out with nice D by D matrices, and you potentially end up in the world D to the fourth. As the cost, as the size of the matrices. That would be okay. That would still give you a polynomial time algorithm. But in fact, hidden in here is a nasty problem. It requires a solution to what's, what Alex and I think others call the pure tensor problem. Pure tensor problem is a statement of this kind. Suppose we're given X tensor Y, given some explicit subspace, we're asked the question. Does it contain an element of this precise form, x tends to y, where x is in x and y is in y? Of course, if you're talking about summation, that's easy. But we're talking about something which is pure. And the reality is that Alex's method of tackling that problem, and I think the only known method for tackling that problem, relies on writing down polynomial equations and producing a basis for the ideal spanned by these and trying to decide whether there's a solution. It requires Grobner basis. It's a very easy Grobner basis, but it reduces the possibility of having a polynomial kind of approach. And we want to know existence, or we want to construct it? I think you have to construct such an element explicitly. Yeah. So I think Alex would be delighted if somebody has this solution which doesn't actually show that this problem is hard. In a theoretical sense, in a practical sense, it's fine. But I want caution. If you've blown up, if you were given 100 by 100 matrices, you've suddenly gone to 100 to the fourth as the size of the matrices. And then actually from a computational point of view, it also becomes expensive. How often does that happen? <laughs> that, uh, I can make probability out of anything, okay? <laughs> I honestly don't know the answer to that question. I mean, but you know, you know something about it in practice, that it's a, usually the- Yeah, it seems to happen very, very readily indeed. Yeah, but, but if you want to rule out the possibility of the existence of this uh, subalgebra, then you've got to be able to run over all, all possible situations. And that becomes a difficulty. That is it's what the quantifiers are in this argument that cause the difficulty. Okay, so that's two examples of, of Ashbacher, an attempt to develop a polynomial time version of Ashbacher. Here's the quick summary for people who care. Uh, I've put, <laughs> Yes and no beside these to indicate which ones can be done in polynomial time, which ones cannot be done in polynomial time. The hard case tensor product I've just discussed, tensor reduction, where you get a kernel, which is a tensor product in that case, and we're back to the same problem as we were already for the tensor, the tensor situation. But you can see a number of yeses turning up. Okay, so. What we're left with is that we have practical algorithms to decide membership, 
lots of people involved. I mean, some of which I've already mentioned, but Carlson, Neunacher, and Colbo, of course, Stephen Glasby, Cheryl, and Elise, which I'll talk about in a moment in terms of work of theirs. And as a byproduct, you do get a polynomial constructive version of Clifford's theorem. Okay, so going back to the general strategy, it says you determine one of these, you know, try to work with that. Otherwise, you're in so-called C8 or C9 territory. You're either in the case where you have a classical group with natural representation or G module is any contained in the automorphism group of some group. So that's the C9 definition. And if you're in C9, what we want to do is we want to reduce from G to a fuzzy sample group. I put quasi in parentheses. I'm not too worried about whether it's whether it's quasi or not. Uh, I want to name L. I want to name L in the sense that I want to know whether I'm working with PSL47 versus working with J1, or I'm working with PSU45 versus working with the monster, for example, if I wanted to be deaf. Uh, okay, the reduction from here, I'm not even going to talk about. The reduction is typically taking derived groups, which we know how to do from a polynomial time perspective. So it's not a hard problem. And the last one is I want to set up constructive isomorphism between L and its standard topic. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Okay, so that's the strategy with more or less the version of this was proposed by Sherwood and, and Peter back in the paper in 1992, and more or less versions of it being followed since then. Okay, so here's the C8 issue. First of all, naming classical groups. I'm given a bunch of matrices that I want to know does it contain SXTQ? I'm using SXTQ as a synonym for all of the standard classical groups. So it includes the orthogonal groups. Original motivation goes back to a computational group theory making where in Oberwolfa for Jakob and Neubis are asked for an analog of the algorithm, which decides whether a subgroup of SN contains AN. The reason why you have that analog is because base and strong generated set machinery work very well except for A and S. Why? Because you've got long, large bases for these two groups. You want to be able to eliminate them, get rid of them before you decide to apply base and strong generate section. And, and there's a very nice algorithm of Peter and John Cannon, which basically relies on subversion of Jordan. I'm not quite sure what version it relies on right now, but it tells you about the existence of, if you find a certain element Involving whose order involves a certain prime, then you're guaranteed to be in a situation where the group contains A. <laughs> and um, with all due respect to Cheryl and Elise Neymar and Peter Neumann, I've summarized uh, an amazing amount of work in a very badly stated theorem. Um, <laughs> so I'm saying they did absolutely stunning work in 1992 and 1998, where uh, it ends up giving you polynomial time Monte Carlo algorithms to name classical groups and natural representation. Uh, this is in some sense an amazing result. That you just need log log D elements. Log log D is very tiny. It's also not just the, the beautiful work which involves the PPD elements and which says that you're searching for certain classes of PPD elements which are contained typically in classical groups and only in a small number of other subgroups of GL. And that's what underpins their algorithms that they're finding such elements. They're eliminating the special cases which turn up and then they can do. But it, it isn't just the beautiful mathematics, but it's also the style in which was, this was done, this work was done, which provided a prototype to be aimed at by others. I don't think very many people have achieved that in terms of the quality of the analysis which has been done, but it's had huge impact at least. Okay, so that's C8 membership, and you get beautiful algorithms coming out of it to decide membership. I, I'm also interested in the case of C9, being able to name groups which lie in the C9 category. And here, there's a work of Babai, Cantor, Park, and Sherry's from 2002, which says to you, if you're given a group which is isomorphic to a simple group of lead type of known characteristic, then its standard name can be computed using polynomial time Monte Carlo algorithm. So one of the things we need for this is to know what the characteristic is, and that's where I managed to entice Martin, first of all, to get involved in this project back in 2007, where we came up with an algorithm which actually determines what the characteristic is. And here, for people who are paying close attention, subject to the existence of an order article. Um, 
It's a nice convenient tool to say these hard problems are piled up to oracles who answer them. Um, in practice, there's a fairly good oracle to answer this question, but it's not perfect. It depends on the ability to factorize. And as people know, factorization is not necessarily a trivial task. But in any case, the end result is we can produce the characteristic fitted in here. And hence, we learned that this is PSL45 rather than being J1. And that's important in terms of the next step we're trying to set up the structure by isomorphisms between your group that you have and a nice copy of the group, which we call the standard copy. There's a version of that algorithm uh, of the characteristic algorithm for Andrew and Sherry's later or later scopes of that. Okay, so structured recognition. This is where we really want to set up a nice morphism between our copy and a nice copy, what I call the standard copy or sometimes called the gold copy. So I'm thinking of C, a group which we know its name, everything else. It's the nice four by four matrices to find over GF7. And we are given some group G with a different generating set. I'm not assuming any correspondence between X and Y. I'm deliberately mixing it up. We can have C under a known generating set. But here we've got something coming out of another algorithm. And now we want to work with that. But what I want to do is I want to construct effective by balls between C and G and G and C. And I want to be able to go both ways, which is why I'm making a fuss about wanting to go both ways, rather than simply assuming that one way would be enough. The key idea is to use standard generators. Standard generators is a concept which actually was first introduced by Rob Wilson for sporadic groups back in a paper in the 1996 of their class. And essentially, they're closed undertaking what Morphin classes. So effectively, you can decide what standard generators are as an algorithm developer. You can decide what the standard generators for a particular group are. And just to give you an idea, if you're talking about SLDQ, for example, we will define four standard generators for SLDQ. Three of them will lie down on the copy of SL2Q, so very little action, and one will be a D cycle with appropriate science to move things around. Now, if you want to think of AN, you have a three cycle and you have an N minus one. Or an end cycle, depending on the parity of it. So those give you an idea. We can make those choices. We're, we're as the developers, able to make that decision. And now the question you is... Say, just say the definition again. I heard closed under order. That, that's all I'm telling you at the moment. That's all I'm stating. Yeah. And that's enough for our purposes. Okay? So I'm starting out with my gold copy, which I'm given which I have a generator say X for, and within that, I can, oh, I, I'm also having a second copy, which is my nasty copy over here, and it has a generating set Y. And there are really two tasks that I want to be able to perform in order to provide a, a constructive isomorphism. And that's the first one is to find S by standard generators in C as words in X. So, I can choose what S is, but I'm given some arbitrary generated set for C, and I want to find S as words in X. The second thing is I want to find S bar. There are images sitting inside of G. So, and now if I can do that, I want to find these as words in Y. Now, if I can do this, then I can simply just extend the map. And that's Essentially, the key concept, we want to be able to find S, we want to be able to find S bar, we want to be able to find them as words, in whatever generating sets we have. We have the ability to choose what S is, so it's not hard to do that. We can make the decision, such as we have three generators which generate SO2 and one D cycle, that's fine, we can do that. And now the rest of it is that if I know what an element is, in S, and I know, it as, I know little h as a word in S, then all I have to do is to evaluate h bar as the word in S bar in order to compute what its image is. So that's how I can go from C to G. And if I have the ability to solve for h bar as a word in Y, I can just go back and compute the free image back in, back in C. Now, I'm deliberately 
not worrying about modular scales. People may start getting obsessed about SL versus PSL. You do have to take care of scalars and it is an issue. And so I'm defining two tasks. One is to find standard generators as words in arbitrary generating sets. And the second is to be able to write an arbitrary element as a word in the standard generators. If you think of my analogy for SLDQ, I took four, four elements. I took three, which lay down an SLQ, and I took a D cycle. If I want to write an element, an arbitrary element of SLDQ as a word in those, it's actually an echelonization procedure, very straightforward echelonization procedure of the kind which drives undergraduates quite mad and drives non-undergraduates even madder because they cannot do it properly. Machines are extremely good at doing such things. However, if I want to write an arbitrary H bar as a word in S bar in some nasty black copy of the group, that's a much more substantial challenge. So I'm saying there's nasty things buried in this very simple model of how we can work with things. And all I've done is I've stated a model. I haven't actually told you about how anything in this can be achieved. Okay, so here's the sort of outcome of, of so many people. I, I, I got bored writing down the list of names and I'm not going to read them out. Uh, but the key point about it is that there's a Las Vegas algorithm that takes as input a named finite separate group G, returns standard generators for G as words in X. And for all but a short list of exceptions, the algorithm runs in time polynomial in the size of the input, subject to the ability to solve the discrete log and to do factorization. Okay. First of all, as I said, there's an enormous number of people who've been involved in this project. Those are some of the names. Uh, one person that I really want to single out who played an important role was Kai Magar. And Kai interacted with Frank and myself and with Akosh, who's also not here. And those are people who contributed a great deal and were very important in driving some of this forward. And in particular, Kai worked on SL3, which turned out to be a very important base case for this algorithm. I offered for algorithms which form part of this theorem. Let me try to identify the short list of exceptions. Here's your challenge problems. Um, okay, it's not as bad as it seems in the sense that for some of these, we actually have algorithms which even run in polynomial time for certain representations of these groups. So for the first two, we do have for the smallest degree faithful representation, finding characteristic, we can answer the problem. What we don't have are algorithms which are cross characteristic or blank. Again, so, uh, 3D forward two to the K, we have a non-polynomial time algorithm which runs for that. It involves a search which is above Q rather than log Q. And for this nasty little group at the end, I'm afraid it's still what I could best describe as complete failure. Henrik Barnheim did an enormous amount of work on some of these, on three of these four groups in his PhD thesis and in papers which he's published since which is where the algorithms for the, for the natural copy come from. Henry was a student of Charles at the UN. Okay, so that gives you an idea of where we are on finding the standard generators. I should have prepared a slide about the rewriting problem or the writing problem of how you write an element as a word in the standard generators. Because we've got fixed standard generators, the problem of writing is at least a definable problem. We're given S, we're given an element of the group, but we want to write X as a word in S. We're not writing X as a word in arbitrary generated set. We found S as words in arbitrary generators. And now what we're saying is, if I take some little g, write it as a word in S. Don't try to write it as a word in, in the original generators, which is impossible, but instead focus on S. And since we were able to choose S, we have some ability to direct the process. There's been lots of work involving Cheryl, involving Chamber Schneider, uh, Don Taylor, a bunch of people who've done work on the question of rewriting. Elliot Costi was another PhD student, Charles, uh, 
So there's a bunch of people whom I'm not mentioning here simply because I ran out of energy writing down all the names for the writing part. So in effect, we get very close to having polynomial time ability to set up structured recognition algorithms between a copy, a nice copy of a simple group and a nasty copy which emerges at step 100 of some rather strange algorithm. And that's immensely useful in terms of translating information from our nice copy to the nasty copy. And I'll come back to that later, but if you want to think about an example, if we know consciously classes, for example, in the nice copy, we can use these maps to map them across to the nasty copy. We're not trying to solve the problem anymore. In the nasty copy, we simply copy the information across. Okay, so that's constructive recognition. And um, just to make one point about centralizing of involutions, I cannot fail to mention this in terms of Cambridge. Cambridge was using centralizing involutions in terms of work with sporadic groups back in the early 1980s and probably earlier than that. Was Richard using them in the 1970s before I was born? 78. 78. Okay. And Alex Reba certainly was, and a bunch of other people. Centralized of evolutions have played a fundamental role here. Of course, they were fundamental to the classification, but we're also talking about them being fundamental in terms of many of the algorithms that I'm discussing here. Certainly, the ones which involve Charles and myself, we've made a great deal of use of centralized evolutions. There's been much analysis done of the cost of constructing centralized evolutions. Uh, to give you an idea of the sort of complexity of these, if you're talking about classical groups, we end up with algorithms which we originally analyzed as d to the fourth log q is the cost of the algorithm where you're having input and the cost of matrix multiplication be d cubed so the fact that we're able to do this in d to the fourth was already pretty pretty good but lots of the analysis which has been done by Sherl and Colva and others since then has pushed and Frank has been involved in that also has pushed that down to probably d cubed log q so in effect for the cost of one multiple matrix modification, we're talking about being able to set up constructive recognition for classical groups and natural representation. Okay, so I want to mention another failure to ask for input, critical base case. And in centralized evolutions, what we often do is become racing down the group to find the smallest object on which we can work. And the smallest object on which we can typically work is SL2. So that's the reason why this becomes a critical base case for much of the work that we're doing. And here's what seems like the most natural problem imaginable. Well, you want to find an element of order P, where P is the defining characteristic. And I don't want you to just write down the matrix, because that's what theoretical mathematicians give us the answer to this question. I want you to find it as a word in X, where X is some nasty generated set, no control over it. I'm not dictating what that generated set is. But I didn't be willing to let you dictate what that generated set is if you can give me an answer to the question. Okay, and so what's the issue? Well, the issue is that the proportion of elements of order divisible by P is bounded above by phi over Q. And so if I want algorithms which are going to run in polynomial time, I can't do a search for such an element as a random, by choosing random elements and hoping to find a, an element which powers up to give me an element of order P. I have to do something better. And the nice better, the beautiful better from Cantor and Kaskov from 2015 is the statement given here, which literally says to you, here's a method guaranteed to give you an evolution. And Richard will say, well, we knew about this back in 1978, and there may well be some evidence to support that. But all you're going to do is find an element of order, order then you just choose the G, satisfies this condition, either this or this diminution. Beautiful. And entirely eminently practical, works immediately, comes with beautiful analysis, everything else. Related properties of dihedral groups. I'm not going to spend any further time on it, but just to say to you, it's a very beautiful. I'm a little confused. <laughs> have I ever got changed in this one? Then HHG could be I might want to remove G is equal to the identity. Where's Mr. Kasparov? Mr. Kasparov, have we left out some condition? I'm suffice to say that it's possible I've left out a condition. 
I don't believe I have, but I think maybe that one's going to be a promotion. You can get one strange. You square one is one that you want to call. No, I think you need the page to page to the gene not to you. Not to you. Not to you. Okay. I, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to say a version of this gives me a version. I get it. So here's my, here's my hard problem. The hard problem is to do the same thing in odd characteristics. First of all, let me tell you what people have done in our characteristic is following. So same problem, I want to find the P element as a word in X. So I'm going to choose an element of the word of Q minus one, but you choose random country. I'm going to compute eigenvectors, corresponding eigenvalues. And then I'm going to find a C and an I, such that B, B, B to the I and C fixes the space spanned by U. And my claim is that if a and B, the I times C, are SO2Q, they have a common eigenvector, then this commutator, the transvection, which fixes U. Okay. Right. So that gives us a three step process. The only part of this which is hard is part three, first two trivial. Part three, there's a reduction which says that I exist if and only if this element, or the space lies in the orbit of U under B. Okay, and after a certain amount of manipulation where you write down the matrix which involves indeterminates, you can reduce the problem down to the following. You're asked to solve this equation. And people who know about such things will realize the way you solve this is by means of discrete log problem. So we need to discrete log problems. And we'd love to have an answer which doesn't rely on discrete log problem. Back in 2006, Marston Condor and my colleague and Charles and myself, we employed this technique uh, to deal with defining characteristic representations of SO2. Essentially, what we're doing is we're taking for our Nesbitt characterization of representations of SO2Q, which tell you you're talking about uh, tensor products of Frobenius twists of groups, and you unfurl your given matrices all the way down to two by two matrices. You use this approach to find the involution, to find the P element in the two by two context and pull it all the way back up to your given representation. Okay, there has been many claimed solutions to this problem in the literature. And I'm going to make the bold claim that all of them obfuscate the actual issue because what they do is they move the problem from a group theory problem to a so called black. Field. And when you're dealing with a black field and you want to set up an isomorphism between the black field and the white field, by the white field, I just mean your standard Galois GFQ. And now you have another copy sitting somewhere which is black. And if you want to set up the isomorphism in both directions between these fields, you end up having to solve a version of the discrete log problem yet again. So, what I, I Two people in particular have done is to write multiple papers which say we have solved the problem of finding a, a transvection in characteristic P where P is odd without recourse to the discrete log problem. What they've actually done is they've moved the problem from the group theoretic context to a black field, and now they have refused to address the question of how you get from the black field to the white field. So I'm saying this problem remains open despite all the claims to the country. And I would love to be able to get a solution similar to whatever version of Kasapov et al. actually is correct uh, in odd characteristic, or even something less, less strong than that. Henry, you're the person who might come up with a nice, um, a nice solution to this. I'm very keen on getting somebody interested. Okay, so let me talk about verification for a moment. Verification, I'm talking about an algorithm how do we get Las Vegas for the algorithm which sets up the constructivized morphisms? Well, we do it by means of presentations. And here are some results, um, some of which is hot up the press. The Casabov et al. 2022 is for the missing case, the, two, the twisted G2. The claim is now that every finite simple group of rank R has a presentation of this length. All of the previous statements by Veronica et al. had the exception of twisted G2. We now have G2 
G2, courtesy of Martin and James Wilson and Alexander Holka and Akko Sherry, since far as I'm aware. So it's a very nice achievement, something hopefully that Martin will write up at some stage. Okay, here's the, I, this was to a great extent, I'm, I'm, without being pejorative, I'm going to state that it was a, a statement that it can be done. Not every detail was spelled out. If we really want presentations to work with, uh, you will notice there's a difference between the length of the presentation. This is log R plus log Q. This is R plus log Q. Where does the R come from? The R comes from our desire that the vial group has some natural generators. So if you want, for example, SR, I want a two cycle and I want an R cycle. You cannot get a presentation for SR, which is of length less than R, if you demand the presence of those two nice generators. You can write down shorter presentations, but what you've done is you've buried something in the middle, which is a word, something that you have to find as a long word in those two generators. So in effect, if you want practical versions of these, which really do work, they even work with coastal enumeration up to quite a respectable level. Our versions for classical groups do that. And from that, you can get presentations that uh, the, Martin and I worked on the exceptional groups. We wrote down the reduced Steinberg presentations, uh, uh, the Curtis Steinberg Teats presentations for the exceptional groups. John Bray et al. have given you presentations of standard generators for the sporadic groups. And, Buried in there, of course, is the A and S in situation. I mean, it's buried in, already in the in the uh, proofs of statements for either theory. Okay, so what we get out of this is verification, explicit presentations which upgrade Monte Carlo to Las Vegas, so we can prove the result. Okay, let me just wrap up by talking a little bit about the final algorithm which comes out of this, which is the so-called composition tree algorithm, and. Basically, here's the idea that you have a node, which is a section of a group, you have an image, you have a kernel, and if we write down the full composition tree, then the leaves are uh, composition factors. Again, the algorithm in its current form was developed by Derek, Henry Barnheim, Charles, and myself. There's a version of it which has been available in Magma for some time. There's a version under development in GAP, which is making good progress. What it gives you as output is it gives you a composition series. It gives you a representation for each term for each factor of the composition series. It gives you the maps between them. It allows you to identify kernels. And very critically, it allows you to solve the so-called word problem, if I can use language in that way, so that we can write an element as a word. Okay. And further, having got presentations for leaves, composition factors, which we have, then if you know kernel and image presentations, it's a very easy exercise subject to a constructive membership to get a presentation for the parent node. Pull that all the way back up to the tree and to verify that the group which you have on its given generator satisfies a particular presentation. Okay, so the construction of the tree is Las Vegas. And one very nice outcome from very recently is the fact that we have managed to prove that subject to the qualifiers here, that you can construct such a composition tree in polynomial time. By constructing that, I really mean we're constructing the composition factors. Note, there's various things. You have to have the availability of polynomial time constructive recognition algorithms. You need short presentations. You've got the short presentation now for everything. All that's left to give you absolute polynomial time is for somebody to solve the few problems that I mentioned earlier, the little trivial problems which are left over for the exceptional groups. And we do not need, I should have pointed out, we do not need tensor decomposition. We do not need tensor induced to get this result. It's not dependent on a polynomial time algorithm for Ashbacher. We've avoided that, we've skirted the problem by burying it in, in constructive recognition rather than leaving it as something that we wanted to reduce. Okay, so that's a very recent result which says to us that we can get composition factors in linear or in, in polynomial time, an analog of the very nice results of Cantor et al. saying that you can do the same thing in the polynomial context or in the permutation context. 
no way are we talking about what the complexity, what the O of D is or anything else. I'm not giving you an estimate for the complexity of the algorithm. We were interested in getting that it runs a polynomial time. Okay, a couple of things that I just want to wrap up with. One is what can we do with all of this? Well, the critical thing that we get from it, and I, it's fair to say we realize this at the end of the process, or at the beginning of the process, is the really critical issue is constructive membership. If you want to be able to hand in something which lies in the generic parent group and decide, does it lie in this group? And if it does, tell me what it is as a word. And that's the very critical piece of information which we're getting from composition tree. All of this has been used as infrastructure for the soluble radical model of computation, which is a very uniform approach to computation with linear groups. What it does is it, it uses a characteristic chain subgroups. Many people will be familiar with the terms of this. Uh, essentially, we've got the soluble radical, and we've got the sockle of G module of the soluble radical, which is a direct product of non abelian subgroup groups. We've got uh, we've got an induction by conjugation on these factors. The, this term is the kernel of this homomorphism from G to the symmetric group. And uh, we have, of course, that this is uh, that this group is soluble. And what Derek Holt and Charles Neil Green, or not Charles, but John Cannon have done over many years have been to use refinements of this series to write down a chain which refines the soluble radical. And then given a problem, this is sort of the philosophy, that given a problem, you solve, you get the answer in G module soluble radical, and you lift the answer back to the chain soluble subgroups. Okay, that's the model. The hope is that you have a nice solution in G module O infinity. And sometimes you do nice solution. Sometimes it's very straightforward. The very last thing I'll talk about is just one of those cases, just to give you an illustration, which is on consciously classes of elements. Um, there's a lot of work which has been done, which I don't have time to go through, but suffice to say that at this stage, we can solve consciously, we can solve centralizers in classical groups, we can solve consciously in classical groups, we can write down centralizers. These are either written down explicitly by algorithm. Sometimes they involve computation, but typically it's a case of literally assembling generators. So given an arbitrary element, we can decide whether it's conjugate to another arbitrary element in the classical group. We can compute a centralized of an arbitrary element, given a pair of elements, we can decide whether we can conjugate them around. So we can do all of that for classical groups. And now what constructive recognition, as I mentioned earlier, allows us to do, it allows us to map such information to arbitrary representations. And in the general case, if you want to extend, you end up with a problem about class representatives and Greek problems. There's theoretical solutions to how to write down class representatives in, in, in Greek products. So this is in G module of the O infinity, that you can literally hope to write down the answer, and now you lift the answer back to the chains. Okay, so that's the that's some of that is already fully available. The machinery to write down all the information in classical groups is available, it's available publicly as part of Magma. And uh, this these sort of algorithms with Canon and are developed back in 97, and Alexander Hopka and Derek, all of them have use the soluble radical model to solve consciously of elements. Okay, I think I've got one more transparency to go. Let me just finish with going back to things I mentioned at the beginning and sort of try and make some statement about what we can do with these. There's one clear challenge which hasn't been addressed, which is how to take all the information that John and Paul and Derek did for maximal subgroups of, of simple groups, classical groups, and actually use that as part of the soluble radical model to actually be able to write down maximal subgroups and typical arbitrary, arbitrary matrix groups. That's a big project. I've tried to persuade Derek that you should do it instantly, but he's so far refused. Another recalcitrant. No, no, no. I mean, my, my abilities of persuasion have dropped off. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It will be done. It will be done. Excellent. In five years' time. Um, zero subgroups, I mentioned it earlier. There is work of Derek and one of these PhD students, Mark Stater, who's written down 
um, is you know subgroups for all p for class groups um, for uh, defining characteristic we can write it down for exceptional groups but not in general um, intersection let me just say to you if you want a project to keep you busy for the next 20 odd years intersection is about it because what you end up talking about is ci intersect cj where i and j lie between one and nine and that's enough of a list of problems to keep you going charles and i have spent a couple of years since march of 2020 working on this and we've made progress on about handful of cases about half a dozen cases i think we've made some progress on but uh, there is about there's a big project there for people to occupy themselves with and if you get bored with that you can go back to normalize the problem where the best that's being done is one of Colvin's students Hannah Kutz, who did some work on this that was with gl working out the normalizer we really don't have a solution via the soluble radical model for how to deal with normals okay Good point. I hope to stop. Thank you. Thank you very much, Damon. Are there some questions? Also here. <laughs> you said something about burying away the tensor problem. Yeah, well, in, in effect, we just ignore the question because all we care. The statement of the theorem is that we can we can determine the composition factors. So what if the group is 100, if the module is 100 dimensions instead of being 10 dimensions? We're just doing more work by working with the 100 dimensional module and setting up, finding its composition, finding group theoretic composition factors uh, and working with 100 dimensions. If we could solve the tensor decomposition problem, we would get down from perhaps from 100 down to 10 and the cost of everything would become much less. But what we did was we avoided the fact that we can't solve tensor decomposition of polynomial time in order to get that statement because we wanted a polynomial time statement. And so what we did was we said, fine, we don't, we don't care about the fact that we haven't reduced from 100 down to 10. It just means it's more expensive. Well, that's a massive challenge that you don't care about. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a massive challenge from a practical point of view. It's not a massive challenge from a, from the statement we were aiming for, which was, can we find the composition factors of polynomial time? Yeah, but those yeah. it, it, it helps you with anything which can fit into the framework of writing down an answer in G module of the soluble radical and lifting information through. What we haven't found is, I mean, you can do things like maximal subgroups of that. You can do consciously classes. You can do a whole bunch of things. I mean, automorphism groups. There's been a whole bunch of algorithms, which I didn't discuss at all, which have been developed by Holt and Cannon and Souvenir and others, which all exploit the soluble radical model. What, what I mentioned these two at the end, even the intersection problem, we're making significant use of all of the machine we've developed. It's just you cannot solve the soluble the intersection problem, the two matrix groups, by saying here's a soluble radical model for one of them, and here's a soluble radical model for the other. We can't we can't exploit it directly, but the machinery of, for example, deciding this group back in primitively, does the group uh, can we solve this membership problem? All of that we're making a great deal of use of. It's just that the soluble radical model lends itself to solutions for many problems. It doesn't lend itself neatly for the intersection part. I mean, we're getting chief factors, we're getting a whole bunch of additional information, such as, uh, for example, consciously classes of subgroups, you know, to get within the soluble radical model. It's just the intersection is, involves two, two objects, first of all. That's part of the difficulty. Oh, I mean, if, that, those two, last two problems, they're difficult in permutation groups as well. Like yeah. I mean, they're not known to be polynomial time. Okay, let's thank Damon again. Someone. 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 Someone.
Even if it's in your bag, that's not real. I'm sorry if I had known that, I wouldn't have, I would have refused to give the talk. I was promised no end of one. Thank you. 